Hello, and welcome to this Bioprocess International Ask the Expert webcast. I'm your host, Jordan Stillman, Project Coordinator for Bioprocess International. Before we get started, just a couple of notes. This webcast is being recorded and will be available for replay in the multimedia section of our website. We've muted the audio lines, but we welcome you to type in your questions for our speaker in the question and answer window on your screen. Please enter your questions at any time. Your questions in the question and answer box will only be visible to myself and our speaker. So thank you for joining us today. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Stephen Broom from Biopharma Spec. Hey, thanks for the introduction, Jordan, and hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Steve Broom, and I'm really excited to be talking to you all today about the analysis and quantitation of impurities using my favorite analytical instrument, the mass spectrometer. Uh, so my goal for our talk today is twofold. First, I would like to provide an overview of impurity analysis, touching on each of the questions listed on the slide. And secondly, I want to give you a taste for the major role that mass spectrometers can play in the detection and quantitation of impurities. Now to that end, I will briefly go over a few specific examples of actual mass spec impurity assays that we carry out regularly here at BioPharmaSpec. Now, I just want to note that our discussion here today is only going to provide a brief overview of a really detailed analytical area. Um, and as uh, Jordan mentioned, you guys can ask any questions during this talk if you want to learn more. And we'll have some time to answer a few questions today. And anything that we don't have time to answer, we'll, we'll be sure to email you guys after. Um, and also, always feel free uh, to email us with any questions whenever. All right, so let's get started. Uh, impurities are unwanted substances present in the drug that fall into one of two specific categories, product or process related. Product related impurities result from modification to the product itself, and I list a few examples here. Now while these are really important to test for, today's discussion is going to center around process related impurities. Process related impurities are introduced into the drug as part of the drug production process and they fail to be removed by the purification steps carried out at the end of the production process. As you can see by the few examples that I've listed up here on this slide, there are a variety of possible process-related impurities that could be in your drug, um, and they could range from small molecules to proteins to DNA and others. Now, th there are two main concerns surrounding impurities in your drug product. First, impurities can cause adverse effects in patients, such as immunological response. And second, they can actually modify the API, or the active pharmaceutical ingredient, which can result in decreased efficacy and shorter shelf life of the drug product. Impurity analysis is listed as one of the key tests for biopharmaceutical product characterization by the ICH-Q6B document, which provides crucial guidance for proper product characterization and is a guidance that we rely on a lot here at BioPharmaSpec when designing our assays. Uh, it's also important to note that in addition to identifying impurities, it's very important to monitor the concentration of impurities, as this will be very important when assessing risk. So impurities should be monitored early on in your drug development process, and you should test at various stages of the drug purification process. By sampling at various stages of purification, you're able to monitor clearance of impurities as they're removed um, from the drug product as you go through the various steps of purification. Having this uh, knowledge of clearance early on allows you to adjust your drug production and purification process with the goal of minimizing and removing impurities whenever possible. So, can mass spectrometry help us here? Uh, fortunately, the answer is yes. And for good measure, I list a few reasons why mass spectrometers are excellent analytical instruments for impurity analysis. Sensitivity and selectivity ensure we can detect and confirm impurity identifications often present at very low levels with very high confidence. We can also use mass spectrometry to discover unknown substances, and that's a capability that many other analytical techniques are lacking. In addition to identification, we can evaluate the concentration of impurities. Uh, with good experimental design, often including internal standards, we can use signal intensity measurements 
to estimate the concentrations of identified impurities. Now, when you're trying to achieve absolute concentration estimates with very accurate concentration estimations, it's very important that you use internal standards that have very similar or identical properties to the analyte being tested. Um, a couple examples of such standards could be heavy isotope labeled peptide analogs or actually spiking the analyte in itself. Now, the reason for this is because different substances will ionize with different efficiencies in a mass spectrometer. And without getting too deep into this, uh, it's just going to be very important that these have similar, that the standard and the analyte have similar ionization efficiencies to get the most accurate concentration estimate possible. And I'll talk a little bit about a little bit more about this uh, later in the talk when we get into a few specific assay examples. Finally, the variety of instrumentation in different mass spec measurement approaches available makes mass spectrometry a versatile analytical approach. And this is going to be really important for impurity analysis because, as we've already seen, impurities can come in a variety of different forms, and each study can have its own unique challenges. So, at its core, most mass spec impurity assays rely on the detection of a mass to charge marker signal at an expected chromatographic retention time to determine if an impurity is present or absent in a sample. These tests can be routine. However, to get to this point, there's a significant amount of method development work that needs to be done to optimize the assay, um, where you're figuring out things like the best sample preparation approach to use, uh, the optimal mass spec method to use. Uh, you also need to assess things like limit of detection and quantitation of your specific assay and specific sample. Uh, and in some cases, we actually have to discover what mass to charge signals and retention times to use as impurity markers. Now, importantly, these challenges can vary quite a bit depending on the impurity being tested and the product that they're in. At BiopharmaSpec, we rely on our considerable experience in both mass spectrometry and biochemistry to address the challenging development of assays, designing and applying methods that will be well-tailored to the specific samples and impurities being tested. Now, I include a few examples of impurity assays BiopharmaSpec has experience with on the slide, and if you're interested, you can check out our website for a much longer list. And today, I'd like to talk briefly about three of these assays. All right, so the first is IPTG. Um, IPTG is an inducer of gene expression that could find its way into a drug product if not removed by the purification steps. Uh, the structure is similar to a monosaccharide, and for that reason, we can use TMS derivatization and gas chromatography mass spectrometry, or GCMS, to analyze this compound. This mass spectrometric approach sequentially eludes sample components from a GC column into a mass spectrometer, which then fragments each component. And what we use to actually identify IPTG is a marker fragment ion. The chromatogram on this slide provides a nice visualization of the type of GCMS data collected for this analysis. As you can see, there's a peak for IPTG detected here with a retention time of 19.3 minutes by measuring an IPTG marker fragment ion of mass to charge 204. Now, by aligning this accurate mass measurement of the expected fragment ion with the expected assay retention time, we have a very high degree of confidence that we have, in fact, identified IPTG in a sample. Now, if IPTG is detected, we can go a step further and calculate the concentration by looking at the peak area of the IPTG peak. And this peak area is going to be proportional to the actual concentration of IPTG in the sample. In order to convert this peak area to an absolute sample concentration, we need to use a spiked internal standard at a known concentration with similar properties and ionization efficiencies to IPTG. Now, for this assay, the standard that we use is actually IPTG itself. And what we're going to do is we're going to take an aliquot of the sample and spike it with a known amount of IPTG. Uh, we can then compare the peak areas of a spike sample to an unspike sample and some basic calculations to estimate an absolute concentration estimation of IPTG with great accuracy. Now, before we move on to the next assay, I want to talk a little bit about this second peak that you can see on the chromatogram here. 
and that's a peak for an internal standard arabitol. And, and we spike this internal standard at an equal concentration in all of the samples that we test. And the reason that we do this is to demonstrate that our sample preparation is working properly and consistently, and to account for run-to-run -run variability. And as far as the run-to-run -run variability goes, all you really need to understand is that it's important to account for this to improve the overall accuracy of the IPTG concentration estimate. So the next assay is a, a test for canamycin. So canamycin is an antibiotic and another common process-related impurity. And the assay that we use to test and quantitate uh, canamycin is actually ve very similar to IPTG. So to quantitate it, we're going to take a sample aliquot and spike a known amount of canamycin into that aliquot and then compare the signal response that we get for the unspiked sample to the spike sample. And this allows us to estimate an absolute concentration of canamycin present in the sample with great accuracy. Additionally, all the sample aliquots are going to be spiked with equal, equal concentrations of an internal standard. And in this case, we use tobramycin as our internal standard. And again, this helps account for run-to-run -run variability that will improve the overall accuracy of our concentration estimation. Now, one key difference between IPTG and canamycin assays is the mass spectrometric approach employed. And I'd like to talk about that a little bit. Uh, so for canamycin, instead of gas chromatography, we use liquid chromatography, which is better suited for the physical chemical properties of canamycin. We also use a different mass spec detection method called multiple reaction monitoring, or MRM. And MRM is an excellent method for targeted detection and quantitation of one or a few substances at once. And essentially, MRM involves two mass filtering steps with one high energy fragmentation step in the middle. And, and using canamycin as an example of how MRM works, uh, for canamycin, we're going to filter out all the mass signals except for the known intact canamycin mass to charge signal of 653.3. Once we've isolated just that signal, we're going to apply high energy and blow that signal up into a bunch of fragment ions. Finally, all of these fragment ions are going to be filtered down to only include the signal for mass to charge 247.1. And this 247.1 signal is ultimately the marker ion that we use to detect canamycin and measure the amount of canamycin present. Now, thanks largely in part to the two stages of mass filtering that MRM includes, we're able to achieve a very clean and optimized signal with this method which gives us very high signal to noise and excellent sensitivity. And, and that's very important when we're trying to, detect, de to detect impurities down to very low levels. All right, the third and final process related impurity I'd like to touch on very briefly today are host cell proteins. Now the analysis of host cell proteins presents a difficult analytical question. There are thousands of possible host cell proteins that could be left behind in a drug product uh, despite the purification steps designed to remove them. And the first step in, in, pure, or in host cell protein analysis is to discover what these proteins are so we know what marker mass to charge signals and retention times to look for. So to address host cell protein analysis, BioPharmaSpec applies a phased approach including discovery, identification, relative quantitation of many host cell proteins at once, and then finally, targeted quantitation using synthesized heavy labeled peptide analogs as standards and multiple reaction monitoring to determine an absolute and accurate concentration estimate for a, key, a few uh, key host cell proteins. Now, this process generally involves three different mass spectrometric methods and two different types of mass spectrometers. And at each phase, the method or the instrument that's applied is specifically selected to address the current goal of the phase. Now, I'd love to tell you all about this process in more detail, but that would take considerably more time than I have here today. Uh, so if you're interested in learning more about our host cell protein analysis approach, we actually have an hour-long talk devoted entirely to host cell protein analysis on our website. And I strongly encourage you all to check that out. So summing everything up here, 
Qualitative and quantitative analysis of impurities is crucial to help develop an optimized product purification process and produce a high quality and safe drug product. The sensitive, selective, and quantitative data generated by mass spectrometry can and should play a major role in the assessment of impurities. And because mass spectrometers are such versatile instruments, various assays can be designed to investigate a wide range of impurities present in different sample types and answering different questions. Um, so I've included some contact information up here on this last slide, and uh, that wraps up my talk for today. And, and thank you, everyone, for listening. And I'd love to answer some questions if we have some time. Great. Thanks, Stephen. So we do have some questions, and um, I will get into reading those now. So the first question is, uh, you mentioned that some process chemicals can have an effect on the structure of the product. Can you provide any examples of such structural modifications and how I could see if they exist on my product? For example, I'm seeing aggregation issues and now wondering if this could be due to an impurity. Right, yeah, so, so yeah, uh, aggregation could be caused by an impurity, um, but it, it's hard for me to, to say whether that's the case in, in this particular drug product without more information. Um, but yeah, that's, that's certainly a possibility. Uh, now, with regards to what different modifications could be caused by impurities, um, I could think of a, a few examples. Actually, one uh, big concern with host cell protein analysis is checking for the presence of um, certain host cell proteins that have protease function. Um, so there's certain types of host cell proteins that are actually able to, to digest a, a protein drug product, where they can clip or truncate the, the product sequence, and that can obviously have a have an impact on your drug efficacy. So that that's a, a specific example of a of a modification that we might see from an impurity. Uh, and I guess just more generally speaking, that there there are a lot of uh, a lot of different modifications that that could happen to a drug product due to impurities or or to other causes. Um, things like deamidation, oxidation, uh, which are are two examples of post translational modifications that that could happen to a protein drug. Um, you could see disulfide bridge scrambling, and, and aggregation is also another example. And, and, and testing for all of these, uh, you, you should be carrying out uh, product characterization testing. Um, and that's where, instead of focusing on impurities like we've talked about today, or process-related impurities like we've talked about today, you're focusing on the product itself. And, and there's a series of tests that you can uh, use to do that, and, and BioPharmaSpec actually does a lot of this testing. Um, there's different mass spec assays uh, where you can do peptide mapping or intact mass analysis. Um, and uh, SEC MOLs and SVAUC are actually two examples of tests that aren't mass spec based uh, that we use to test for aggregation. All right, thank you. Um, so it appears we're running a bit short on time. So this actually will be our last question. So if I needed to, could I get these residual analysis methods used for batch release? Yeah, yes. So yeah, you could do these impurity tests for batch release testing. Um, uh, with that being said, though, all the data and assays that I've discussed here today were, were carried out by BioPharmaSpec, and, and we're actually not a GMP or GLP certified lab. And, and batch release testing should be done by a GMP or GLP certified lab. Um, however, what a uh, biopharma spec can do is we, we can develop methods, right? And because we're not uh, as restricted as some GLP and GMP labs are, uh, we're actually better positioned to handle the development work that needs to be done to get an assay that, that's good for batch release testing, right? Because for batch re release testing, you really want the assay to be more routine and, and you don't want to have to worry about all that development work. So something that we do at biopharma spec a lot is um, develop these methods and then uh, perform a tech transfer over to a lab with GLP or GMP uh, certification. Um, and, and that's one way that we could help contribute to, to batch release testing. But yeah, you could use these assays um, for regular uh, batch release testing. All right. Well, thanks, Stephen. And thank you, um, thanks to, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, and thanks to our audience for joining us. Um, so the recorded version of the webcast will be available for on-demand viewing on our website. And as a registered attendee, you will receive a follow-up email providing you with a direct link. We look forward to having you join us at our future Bioprocess International Assay Experts webcast, 
Look for those announcements in your inbox. Have a great day and goodbye.